Okay. Greetings to all from um, East Columbus, Ohio. I'm Sally Crane Cox, Chair of the Matriots PAC Board. Here on, let's see, it's Thursday, March 26th at 10.33 a.m. I apologize to those of you who are trying to access us on Facebook live. Uh, we are having a little trouble, but we are going to be loading this as you are seeing it now on Facebook if, in the future. Anyway, uh, I, I put out the date there because as we all know, we're in the middle of a major crisis, medical crisis that has uh, us all sheltering in place in Ohio. Um, but we are continuing with our conversations with our Matriots endorsed candidates today. I'm very excited to have a conversation, a discussion with Burl Brown Piccolantonio, who's president of the Board of Education of the Gahanna Jefferson School District, where I live. Uh, the Matriots were honored to endorse Burl in, for her reelection campaign in 2019 when she ran for her second term on the Board of Ed. So we're going to start with the most important question. How's your family doing? Oh, thanks, Sally. Um, my family is actually doing pretty well. Um, so I have three sons. I've got a sophomore, an eighth grader, and a fourth grader. And then my husband and I are now both home, working from home. Um, and my little immediate family is doing great. Um, we also have a dog at home who's very happy to have us here um, right now. Um, we're adjusting to this new normal, um, getting into our routines, but for the most part, we're doing pretty well. Great. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, we are going to be taking questions from uh, the internet. I, I'm still like getting used to how this all works, but I know. <laughs> folks are on mute, but asking questions via chat. And so we would ask anybody who has a question of Burl to hit your chat feature and po type in your question. We do already have a good series of questions from Kim Mason, who has asked one, proves the coronavirus impact bill and pushes off state testing and the report card. How will remote learning impact K through 11, positively or negatively? Any thoughts? Um, yeah, so it, we, in the school districts, I think we've all been kind of waiting anxiously to see what the legislature was going to do. Um, interestingly, I kind of feel like um, we, in the school districts, um, started processing some of these things a little quicker than other people. Um, the schools were actually one of the first, um, one of the first decisions that got made from the governor that impacted a large group of people was to close our K-12 school buildings to students. Um, so it feels like that was like a year ago, but that was just, um, I guess that was March 13th is when the decision was made. Um, and then many school districts, Gahanna included, actually that Friday the 13th was the last day that students were in the building. Um, so that decision was made and it, we were told, um, you know, it was, there was an end date that was given to us, but we all know that that's a very tentative end date. And I think the governor and Dr. Acton have reinforced that that end date is going to continue to be reevaluated. Um, Gehanna was really fortunate because we were kind of already set up for a situation like this. Um, a couple years ago, the board approved spending to provide all of our students in, in our school district with a Chromebook. Um, so students grades six through 12 actually all have a one-to-one -one district provided Chromebook. And then our younger students um, work with Chromebooks in the classroom. They're one-to-one -one in the classroom. They just weren't taking them home. Um, but all of our kids were already prepared with those devices. They were already using Google Classroom. Um, so in a lot of ways, in our school district, we were really prepared, but the things that we needed to hear from the legislature back to Kim's question, um, were things about state testing um, and about attendance for students and about um, district report cards. So um, I think we, we, at least we, the governor hasn't signed the bill yet, but it was a unanimous vote from both the House and the Senate um, yesterday. And I think it's anticipated that the governor is going to sign the bill. 
um, which releases school district school districts from the obligation of this year's state testing. Um, it also allows for a local decision to be made about students' graduation. So what the legislation says is that um, a school district has the ability, if, if a senior was on track to graduate before the school buildings close, then the local school district can make the decision that that student will graduate. Um, Kim's, I'm looking back at what her actual question was, but she asks, um, how will remote learning have a positive or negative impact? I mean, my overall opinion is that online virtual learning is not an ideal environment really for anybody to be learning, but particularly for students in grades K through 12. Um, I think all of us are doing the very best we possibly can. I know our teachers, I've seen some amazing things that some of our teachers all around Ohio are doing. Um, to try to be creative, to try to engage with students. They're doing a lot of this, the Zoom conferencing. Um, and um, I know in our district, our students have morning meetings. So a lot of our teachers are continuing to do the morning meetings with kids. Um, I don't think any of us can answer the question though, until this is all over, how it's going to impact learning positively or negatively. I think it's definitely different. Yeah. Like I said, I really feel strongly. I think um, teachers are doing the best they can. I think administrators are doing the best they can. Um, the kids are working hard mm -hmm. um, and the parents are too. So we'll see. And then Kim had uh, three more questions, which kind of you covered in some ways, but so I'm going to just generally lump them together about uh, discussions on how we're going to measure and track success of our students, but also knowing that the state report card needs revision. Will school board members take this time out to work? Well, you did talk about working with the legislators in the Ohio Department of Education to create a school report card, which yeah. is reflective indicators. And then if parents do not have technology resources or choose homeschooled methods to educate their children, will the families be penalized for not using remote learning options? Yeah, I think that last question is one I, you know, I don't worry about that, like I said, for our school district in Gahanna, um, because we were prepared, um, not having any idea that something like this was coming. Um, but we did make the decision to invest in devices. And we are very fortunate that um, there's good broadband access in central Ohio. Um, and then for those students who don't have internet access in our school district, our um, IT department is working one-on-one -on -one with those families to make sure that they have an internet connection. But I've been thinking about that a lot when I think about just in general across the state of Ohio, there are such, there's such disparity. Um, there's so much difference in the resources that people have. Um, I mean, there are areas of Ohio where there literally is no broadband access at all. So even if there are companies that were willing to step up and offer free internet access, the connections aren't there. Um, as far as whether or not those students in those districts would be penalized, I think the answer to that is no. Um, the, the legislation, um, basically provides that they're, we're not going to be evaluated. Um, it, it's my understanding. I, I want to be a little bit careful because I haven't, I've seen the text of the amendments, but I haven't seen um, an analysis of any of it yet. Um, so I don't think that districts and students are going to be penalized, but I definitely think that there's going to be a difference in how um, remote learning happens across the state, dependent upon whether there's access to the internet, access to devices, um, and then whether or not the district is prepared to deliver those things. Um, so again, that'll be something that we're gonna be sorting out and untangling, I think, in the state and across the country for a long time. And I do think that, I mean, it's not a silver lining, but it, it's really illustrating the, 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 the digital divide. Yes. Right in our own districts and in our own state. And hopefully will help us to better um, address that moving yeah. forward after this is all. Yes, because that's not all. something that just impacts kids now. I mean, that's something that impacts us 
in the regular um, right. world too. So hopefully this, I mean, I hope that there are, I definitely think there will be some positives from all of this. Hopefully that's one of them is that people better understand the need to um, make sure that there's better equity for kids. Exactly. Okay, on to a question from Christina McLemore. How is the school district dealing with students who are disenfranchised and for those, oh, I'm sorry, we did sort of cover this in the rural parts of our state. Yeah. Yeah, so great questions and right in keeping with where we are. Um, you know, I, I also think we talk a lot at the Matriots Pack about uh, balancing the sort of long-term mission uh, and goals in light of the recent short-term COVID crisis. That's what we're talking about right now, too. And I recall from your screening interview when you were seeking our endorsement that the Gahanna Jefferson Board of Education was in the middle of a master uh, facility plan. This kind of work uh, doesn't just stop when there's a medical crisis and or any kind of immediate crisis. And so how do you balance managing the crisis and planning for the future? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, so as far as Gehanna goes, and as far as our master facility process goes, um, I actually asked yesterday, um, because I was curious, we are in the very beginning phases of big building a new building. Um, and as from what I heard yesterday, we're still on track with that. Um, we are also, as you just said, we're in, um, kind of the midst of the beginning of our phase two of our master facility plan. And we are trying to move forward with that as best we can. So our, um, we had done a, um, a series of community engagement sessions before all of the shutting down began. Um, and then what was next was taking all of that information gathered from all the community engagement sessions and bringing it to our master facility committee. Um, they are still scheduled to meet virtually now um, and kind of digest all of the information. Um, we are still on track to have them have a recommendation that they're going to be presenting to the, to the school board in May. Um, that's the timing. So the thinking is that um, the board has to vote on a plan to put on the ballot at our May board meeting if we're going to stay on track for a November levy. Um, and you're right, I mean, there were so many decisions that had to be made so quickly over the course of the last couple weeks that had nothing to do with any of that. And at the same time, um, you know, we do have these big things going on and we don't want to lose track of them and we want to keep them at the forefront of the priority. So um, there's got to be balance. And I, I, I guess I just want to say, like, I'm, I am extremely proud of um, all of the people who are in our school district, um, the, I, I think I said the decision was made that um, buildings were going to close on Friday the 13th, but that week before, um, you know, we had, there had been kind of hinting that the buildings were going to close. And then we were still, you know, all districts were still going about their daily um, operations while trying to plan for this eventuality. So. I'm, I'm just, um, I couldn't be more proud of my district for sure, um, but all of our, our, our school districts for, for balancing um, all of those things and having decisions really quickly based on really quickly changing information. Yeah, it's, it's really challenging. And you know, I think it's interesting because um, we as women often consider work-life balance like every day. <laughs> and now all of us around the nation are looking at what does work-life balance look like? You know, and I also recall from your screening interview, I was so impressed that you had had two children while you were going through law school. That was really like, wow. Uh, and I think you're also an ombudsman for the State Bureau of Workers' Compensation. How are you and your husband like literally handling the stress of the current situation? And do you have any tips? I mean, we hear a lot about how to keep your children engaged during this time, but any tips that you want to offer for um, having children at home and staying connected to loved ones? Sure. Um, so I don't know if I would be impressed by the having of two kids during law school. <laughs> that is not something that I would advise that anyone do. It was a lot to balance. Um, I was working full-time then too. 
Um, and it was a lot to balance. But I also think it was, I mean, it was great prep for life um, where we are always trying to balance lots of different things. Um, so as of, let's see, last, so I do work full time. I'm an attorney. Um, I work full time. Um, last week was the week that I was really focused on work and my own staff and trying to make sure that everybody was set up to be able to work from home. Um, and I think starting Thursday of last week, I was home working and my husband was also home working. Um, my, our kids are actually on spring break this week, but mm -hmm. they had online learning last week. Um, so they, um, they kind of had to get established in their own routines for a little while last week before mom and dad were home. But um, I gave them all three of them, my, my 10 year old, my 13 year old and my almost 16 year old, their very first assignment actually came from mom. And it was to draft a, a routine, draft a schedule for themselves. Um, I didn't want to I didn't want my husband or I to kind of impose a schedule on them. I wanted them to come up with what they thought would work well for them. Um, and then we had a family meeting and talked through everybody's schedules. And um, I know not everybody operates that way, but for our family, I think that was a really helpful way to get, um, to kind of get set in this new reality. Um, so we all have our work day or work week, school week schedules, and then we have our weekend schedules. Um, and they're all, all five of us have different routines, um, but it helped us to talk them through so that we know what each other's schedules are. Um, and then we all each kind of have our own area where when we're doing either our work or our school work, um, there's some privacy there. And I think that was really helpful also. Um, but I did say, I think I said, I think there are a lot of positives that are coming out of all this too. And I know um, in our own house, in a lot of ways, um, the pause has been really, um, in some ways, kind of like really nice for our family. Um, we've had a lot more time where we're not trying to run from work to a kid's activity. Mm -hmm. We're home and we're playing board games together. We are having all of our meals together. Um, so that's, that's actually been a really nice side of this. Um, the other really nice side of this for me personally um, I have a grandma who lives in Cleveland. She's 91 and a half years old. Um, and I talk to her on the phone um, maybe every couple weeks normally, but we've been talking with her much more often during this. So that's also been really nice. Um, I don't know, some other tips, I guess. Again, I'm a schedule person, but um, with friends and, and um, even like social things, I, I've been taking advantage of the technology. Um, so scheduling things like a coffee meeting or a virtual happy hour even. Um, it's just nice to be able to kind of have that face-to-face -face interaction with people still, um, even if you're not there in person. Um, it's also good to get outside. We've been so lucky here at least that it's been warm and sunny. And just to get outside there, actually there's people, I don't know about you, but every time I go outside, I find that they're like the whole neighborhood is out there, which is also unusual and nice. Um, so although everybody's maintaining their distance, um, there's a lot more interaction just in the neighborhood than there is on a usual basis. I agree. I think that, um, you know, talking about the silver linings again, it's just, yeah. you know, the ability to connect with neighbors and to operate in a sort of slower time. It's been really nice. Yeah. Um, you mentioned your, your, your extended family. You come from a huge political. Um, your mother, Marilyn Brown, is Franklin County Commissioner. Your father, Eric Brown, is on the Columbus Board of Education and was the Chief Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court. So you come by this work on the Board of Education naturally. Obviously, service is important to you and you're a very um, 
thoughtful and planful person. But how did you go from running for school board, as you originally did, to becoming board of education president? Um, so I would say that it was probably not a typical situation um, because I ended up um, agreeing to serve as president in my first first year, my first term on the board. Um, we had kind of a divided board. There was some um, division in the community before I came onto the board. Um, and, and when I came on, um, it was kind of thought that I could be a person that would help bring people together. Um, so I don't think it's very typical. It didn't feel typical to me um, to, at my very first meeting, um, take over as board president. Um, it, it was actually, I mean, it was a lot in that first year. Um, I have been asked to continue to serve as board president since that time. And I really think that it has a lot to do with um, my belief that when people are serving um, on a board or on a commission, but in a situation where there's multiple people, um, I feel strongly that each of the people that are on that board or whatever the, the entity is, we all have an equal role. And um, whenever one of us knows something, all of us should know something. Um, and I feel really strongly, I guess, about transparency, not just with each other, but with the community too. So I think that that's why um, I've been asked to continue to serve in this role. Um, it was certainly a transition. Campaigning and governing are two really different things. I think there are some skill sets that are common, um, but what you're actually doing is really different. That's, yeah, I, I, I find school boards fascinating and school board service fascinating because in Ohio, as in so many other states, I think that school boards are considered the least powerful level of government, of political government. And certainly the major political parties don't even go there. You know, that's just not on their radar screen in terms of races to look at. And therefore, that's why partly why the Matriots PAC sees this is a real opportunity for advancing our mission of getting to 50% female representation in political office throughout Ohio, because there's a lot of opportunity here. And, and, and our research, which was groundbreaking around finding out how many women are in political office in Ohio, showed us that school boards, um, we have the greatest representation. 37% of school board members are female. Um, and I think that's ironic because school boards are so powerful. I, you manage multiple facilities, you have huge budgets, you have personnel issues and you're handling all these public taxes and while shaping the curricula and education of our and minds of our children you know so talk to us about women's political leadership and the opportunities for going from school board to higher office or what the opportunities are around school board service yeah i, I always find it interesting too when people talk about um running for political office i don't often hear people talk about school boards mm -hmm. um, but i think you're right i mean i think that we, the skills that, that somebody learns and the skills that somebody practices while serving as a school board member um, are skills that are useful in any kind of um, political office. Um, I, and, and I agree, I mean, the decisions that we're making, um, yes, the, the, um, the personnel issues, those kind of issues, but the, the decisions that we're making, I mean, we are truly making decisions that impact so many people, young people, um, people who are going to be future leaders and future um, employees. Um, it's fascinating to me that people don't often um, think about school board when they're thinking about political office. Um, but I do think that, I, I think the same opportunities for serving in different office um, exist for, for a school board member as they do for anyone serving in any other kind of office. Um, and in some ways, um, the constraints that we have um, related to budget, related to how schools are funded, um, I mean, I it's this is gonna sound, kind of silly, but it's so complicated that I think that if you can figure out how to navigate that, you can really figure out how to navigate 
almost any kind of scenario. Um, it's unfortunate that it is as complicated as it is, but I do think it's um, a tremendous training or serving opportunity for people. Um, I also, I guess I feel really strongly that um, local service and that close engagement within, within your own community, um, I think, I guess I maybe I'm biased because that's where I'm serving right now, but I think that that is um, incredibly important training for service in general. Um, it teaches you, I mean, I can't, <laughs> my kids probably, I don't know if they love it or hate it, but we can't really go anywhere without running into somebody who might have a question about something. Um, but I think that that is so important for people who are serving um, to remember how much impact the decisions that they're make, making have on people, um, real people, um, and that kind of local service, you actually see it every day. So um, I think it's, it's a great foundation for any kind of service that anybody wants to do. Uh, we did have another question come in from Christina McMore. For many uh, children and youth, school is their safe place. How are schools addressing how we can keep children and families safe now that we have a stay-at-home order? I think that is um, a great question. When I will tell you that the uh, my superintendent and I actually were on the phone um, when the decision was made to close the buildings to students. And the very first thing that we talked about was how can we make sure that our kids are still getting fed? That was the, I mean, you can talk about education and we need to educate the kids, but if we're not making sure that their basic needs are met, I don't know how we get much beyond that. Um, so I think that all school districts um, have stepped up. They're trying to make sure that, and not just the districts, um, for us in Gahanna, we have community partners um, that are helping to make sure that our kids' basic needs are getting met. Um, but beyond food, I guess, and beyond um, shelter, there are, I mean, Christina is right, um, school can be the safest um, place for some people. That may be the only place for kids where they're, um, they are getting warmth, they are getting love, they are having routines. That may be the only place for them. Um, and I guess I would say, I think teachers are doing as much as they possibly can. I've seen, um, talk about silver linings. I don't know if you've seen, but I've seen some video clips um, of teachers doing things like, I saw a parade, a car parade of the teachers driving through kids' neighborhoods. Um, so the kids all knew to come out at the end of their driveways at a certain time and the teachers were in their individual cars maintaining appropriate social distance, but just driving through the neighborhoods and waving to the kids. Um, you know, there are certainly some things that a district can't do by itself and that's why we need our community partners um, to, to step up and provide some of those other things and I really I mean, I can only speak to what I'm experiencing and what I see, um, but I think people really um, are doing the very best they can to try to meet all of those other needs. So in closing, because I think we're wrapping up here, I wanted to point out, which was pointed out to me, your t-shirt. Yes. Not all heroes wear capes, which is, you know, Dr. Amy Acton. Our State Department of Health Director has been, has sort of been putting that forth, yeah. right? Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. And then also, I just wanted to say thank you for your service in our uh, school district. Thank you, Sally. Um, yeah, I, I would just like to mention um, Dr. Acton. Um, so if... I know a lot of people have um, been watching the two o'clock or 2.30 press conferences with Governor DeWine and Dr. Acton. Um, I would say that one of the other silver linings from all of this is the opportunity for all of us in Ohio and really across the nation to see this amazing leader in Dr. Amy Acton. Um, there's a Youngstown uh, Vindicator news article that kind of gives her life story. Um, and she, you know, she had a pretty challenging childhood, um, including some time spent living in tents, um, being homeless. 
Um, and she went on to become a doctor and not just a doctor, but our, our state's doctor right now. Um, I don't know about you, but just in my feeling, having her up there um, at all of the press conferences, explaining things clearly, ex explaining the science clearly, and not just clearly, but I think compassionately and with empathy. Um, for me, it's, I think it's just, it's wonderful for all of us to be able to see um, this strong, fierce, intelligent, empathetic and compassionate woman um, standing up there every day for us and making the decisions um, to make sure that we can all be safe. So I did buy the shirt. Um, this is a shirt. Uh, there's a local company homage or homage. I'm not saying it correctly. Um, they are rate the proceeds or part of the proceeds from the shirt are going to the Huckleberry House, um, which is an organization that helps um, some of our at risk youth. Um, I thought that was neat that they teamed up with Dr. Acton to, to make sure that um, a shirt like this would also go towards um, a really important cause. Well, you just summed up exactly the way I wanted to end. So because I think we really need to talk about and think about and be thoughtful about the short term yeah. solutions that we all need to consider, like making sure that homeless youth are sheltered and taken care of. And then the long term mission, which is that we need more women in leadership. Yes. Women like Amy Acton, women like yourself. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sally. That's all for today. Thanks from the Matriots Pack.